Hello and welcome, I'm Lorenzo, you're watching KSP to Mars, today episode 36, where once again we're going to the moon, and this time to stay there. The contraption I've made, it's a nice base to stay on the moon, and it's got 15.8 kilometers per second of delta V. I'm hoping that's going to be enough to get to the moon and land there, and we will see that shortly. I'm going to leave the payload to be a surprise, well, at least a little bit. You can tell from the various readouts here a little bit what's going to be in it. At least these are the astronauts, Riches B, the veteran, and Milmoan, the somewhat less veteran, but still very veteran, lunar astronaut. Don Mal the newbie, he's going to come along, and two of them will do the laboratory. Yeah, I uh, spoiled that, didn't I? Right, I'm going to launch that. And because the previous episodes have all been very, very long, I'm going to try and make this one a little bit shorter. And as promised, here we are at the moon. And this is what was the payload of the booster. A laboratory, a three-man capsule, a infrared telescope, of course the reactor, and the heat radiators mounted right on top of the capsule because the gerbils are already green. And a propulsion system for the whole thing with, of course, landing legs as well. That's the good news. The bad news is that the cacophony comedy of failure is once more continuing. We don't have enough fuel to land. We have 1200 meters per second and our speed here is 1600. So even if we were to be able to do a perfect suicide burn, no go, we wouldn't be able to land. We'd crash with at least four or 500 meters per second and these small landing legs do not hold up to it. So orbital laboratory once more. Let's do, yeah, begin the research. Oh no, of course the Gerbils need to go in it. They're now in the command pod. Uh, more bad news. This deep field survey doesn't work. Because this telescope needs helium coolant. I had no idea. So that's useless. It's just a three ton paperweight. Without which the mission might very well have succeeded. So, the m <laughs> wow, <laughs> look at the Gerbils here in the bottom. Um, yeah, she is definitely going into the laboratory now. And, well, the space station is orbiting nice and low at about 40 kilometers. And, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a lander anymore, it's now a space station. It's orbiting at 40 kilometers. And that should give us the highest amount of science per day from this laboratory. And that's also what it is going to do, because, well, there's really nothing else to it. Um, they can't get back with this amount of Delta V, or actually they might be able to get back, but this uh, capsule doesn't have any uh, doesn't have any any re-entry mechanism, and well, landing is out of the question because well, they don't have the the Delta V for it. I didn't put any docking ports on this thing because well, it was going to be landed, so no need for docking. So it can't even be refueled or helped out in any other way. So uh, that is all rather uh, useless. Hey, the science rate is 0.2 per day here, and the other laboratory had 0.3. Maybe there's a diminishing return for multiple stations around a celestial body. But uh, the readme of the plugin told me that the closer it was going to be to the surface, um, the more science it would gain. Or perhaps it also depends on the stupidity of the Kerbals, because these are f a lot more stupid than the other ones. Anyway, that's nice. So in total, we're now harvesting about half a science point per day from the moon and about 0.15 per day from Kerbin. Now, that's not quite a whole science point per day yet, but a starting transmission. Is there data to transmit? I wonder what data can be transmitted. Um, it just said OK and then it said done. So, probably nothing to transmit. I did bring some sensors, so let's fire off a random scan if I can find them again. Always a challenge on this science module. Need to rotate it and then any science should present itself to me. Hopefully. I think I put a, at least a seismic experiment on it. Oh, I put them on the on the generator here at the top, of course. So let's deploy all that. Doesn't do anything. Even brought a gamma ray spectrometer to display uranium hotspots and thorium abundance, so that we might land near some of that. Nothing. We don't have any use for it now, but 
you know, always good to know where the resources are. Yeah, yeah, this is not going to do anything for us, so... I'm going to switch to the other one. Oh no, first I'm going to give this a nice name and brand it as a station. Uh, failed lander and it's a station. Good. Now let's switch to the Luna 4. Switch to that. Ooh, and this had six science added to the R&D center as well for well, the intervening period. Let's zoom in. There it is. Let's see if we can't rename this one as well. Oh no, this doesn't have the this doesn't have the command module, so also no renaming. So this is going to remain a ship. Still the scientists inside they don't know. And well, I'm not going to tell them so they can keep on sciencing. So um let's visit the station around Kerbin. That can add some science to the pool. Two science added there. So with that time to return to the space center and this episode has not been long yet. I am going not much of a design here. Uh, we're going to launch this rocket into space with this small capsule loaded with a bunch of sensors. Uh, we're going to test out the Prasmat barometer. Look, here it is. Oh, this took all four of them. I bound them to an action group so that um, I could control them even through the fairing. I thought I just got the one, but I have like four, so I'm going to keep one and recycle the other three. And then hopefully, if I do this again, it does the three remaining, so that's good. And the gravity scan was bound to the same key. Uh, this, anyway, back to the mission. This um, capsule with a large heat shield that will be tested as well will go into a polar orbit and get a lot of gravity data from all the biomes and return that. And of course, test the barometer and possibly most importantly, test the heat shield for the large capsule, see how that goes under re-entry. So I'll see you in orbit when all that interesting stuff is going down. And here we are in orbit, gathering data with our gravity sensors. Look, here they are all laid out on the pod. And this larger heat shield is probably really nice in that it will allow stuff on the capsule to survive re-entry. We'll see that in a bit though. First, let's take our last measurement of the deserts. And with that, I have taken gravity readings over the grasslands, highlands, water, shores, ice caps, tundra, mountains, and badlands, and of course, deserts. So, fairly complete list, I think. And that makes it time to, well, bring the boys home and re-enter. So, I'm going to point it retrograde and attempt a periapsis of 65 kilometers. I think that should be safe and not uh, take too many passes around the planet since we're not coming in particularly hot. So let's fire up the engine and see what what our trajectories do. 80, 70, 66. Let's keep it at that. So throwing in a quick save, see if anything glitchy goes on, then I can revert to that but I'm not counting on it and I will just accelerate time to that point. What I didn't do on liftoff was manage a pressure scan of the lower atmosphere because that apparently that boundary happens below 22 kilometers or something and I only started doing that, doing the scans at, well, at 25 or something. So, oh no, do, are we on, going to do a night landing? Here we are going to do a night landing. Well, too bad, didn't think about that. So what I want to do is take a pressure scan while we're in the lower atmosphere, but that should be after um, after any, any re-entry hazards. So Genius Me put this on the night side, so I'm going to cut out the video because this isn't very exciting to watch. I'm going to cut out the video and um, I'll come back to you with the results or when something uh, interesting or amazing is in the process of happening. So. See you in a little bit. 
and here we are re-entering. Uh, our periapsis is currently sub-zero. It was 65 when we entered the atmosphere, but because we were doing so at a fairly slow speed and a long way away from the periapsis, the very slight drag from the upper atmosphere has, well, made the rest of the re-entry very, very steep. And I'm not quite sure if that... Wow, this uh, heat shield has quite some ablative force. Um, I'm not quite sure if that is good for us or not. Fact is, we are going to hit the surface, so there's no skimming out into space anymore. Uh, fact also is that we've not slowed down that much yet, and in that way, this pod is so much different, well, at least this, this uh, heat shield is so much different from the Mark I pod. That is a bit strange, I think. Something is wrong with my config file in the Mark I pod. But anyway, we're here with the Mark II or three or whatever, the three-man pod, and that is re-entering now. Finally, the heat is coming in and the deceleration is rising. We're at 100 kilonewtons now, so that should not be too long. Of course, this combination is a lot, lot heavier than the Mark I pod. This pod here weighs 4 point something tons. This heat shield weighs 4 point something tons. Um, and the other kit weighs a little bit. So that is a lot heavier than, than the other things. So all this drag is not having as much as an, as an effect on the ship as it would were it the smaller and lighter pod. But still we are decelerating at about 2 Gs now. And well, we are also still falling. Let's have a look at how fast that's currently happening at minus 250 meters per second. So that is really quick. I hope everything is going to go fine. If the G-forces become intolerable, then of course these three brave guys, they will pull the parachute before they die. And it seems as if the reaction wheel is having some trouble stabilizing the pod. I hope this configuration is in fact stable. I'm having to do some control input to, well, to keep everything pointed and oriented into the right way. Now at 300 kilonewtons, we're coming up on 5 Gs, and we still have 6 kilometers per second to go. We're also still falling. And that now at 350 meters per second. So we're getting into the thicker air very, very rapidly indeed. If I... Well, it appears that this configuration slightly angled over is the aerodynamic stable position. We are slowly encroaching on the red zone for these astronauts. They are rapidly starting to slow down. But we're at 48 kilometers, which is, of course, rather low. Is Our heat, our heat shield is ablating really quickly. But then again, this is the big heat shield and that has, well, several tons of ablative material. So I'm not getting worried about that. I am getting worried about these G-forces. We are coming up on 10 Gs and I'd rather not deploy the parachute here because that would probably insta-crush these Kerbals. But I am going to deploy it if that pressure warning, that, that G-force warning is going to pop up because I want the science. I want this gravity scan of the planet. And now that we've got three Kerbals, maybe one or two will survive if the others start having trouble. Then again, it could be that this capsule has better G seats, reaching crew limit. Here goes the chute. It's not quite deployed yet. Oh, there it goes. Oh, and there it goes, heating. Well, they're done for now, because the parachute couldn't cope with that re-entry heat. So that was a definite mistake. The G-forces are dropping, but... Well... What can I say? The, the crew is toast, and so is the data, unfortunately. That is really quite unfortunate. They even made it through, they all three made it through the G-Force crush, but this parachute was susceptible to the heating, so I hope my antenna made it. Let's have a look at these things, where we can maybe send home some data before we crash here, so <laughs> let's quickly transmit all of that and then wave goodbye to our Kerbal friends. Transmit. You'll notice that there's quite a few sensors that have 0% on the transmission. That is because, well, how can I put it? because that already had been transmitted once and was we were really counting on the well on the return of that data instead 
Fortunately, the atmospheric pressure scan is something that we can flying at Kerber and transmit that home, please. Log gravity data. Oh, logging it. No, we're not going to log it. So this way we at least get some science. Is there anything we can do to save these guys? There is not. Are we coming in over land? Because we do have some stuff on the bottom of this capsule, so maybe they will survive. But I am not overly hopeful for their sakes. If I'm just gonna see if I angle the craft like this. Maybe we can get a little bit of body lift going where well, where the impact isn't so bad, and then we can hit on the heat shield first, then the SES system, and then maybe the capsule can survive. But I don't think that is something that's going to be feasible. I'm going to spin it up, add some angular momentum in there, so that when we do hit, things are a little bit more likely to to throw to, to fly away and well do something funky. Oh here we go, seven hundred meters. Five hundred meters coming in way too quickly, almost at half a mark. Yeah, no, they all died. And <laughs> we did record the impact. Well, wonderful. With that, let's return to the space center. Right, not quite the space center after all. Uh, I have a confession to make. I used the quick load. The mission we flew today was very simple, not complex at all, just time consuming. So I decided not to redo it, just instead redo the re-entry. And I think that went fairly well. I put the periapsis at 70 this time instead of 66 and that made all the difference. G-forces didn't get over, well, they did get over one. They didn't get over like seven or eight, so now we can ditch the heat shield and glide into a safe and comfortable landing. And then we can recover the science. Of course, these three Kerbals, they are dead. That does not, um, that, that, that doesn't change. So, well, I'm not going to chuck them out the airlock. That would be too heartless. They do have feelings now again. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, position them here on the ground and just not take them back to the KSC. They are infected with ooh, with the quick load virus. So they are no longer welcome. Sad as that is. They don't know why, but they are unclean. Let's put the quarantine marker, the quarantine marker out here. Wait, I misspelled that. Well, the next the next guy can spell that better. <laughs> it's like the Three Stooges or the Daltons or something where they can't write. <laughs> so this one here. Wow, there's a lot of radiation here. 266 nano sieverts. Where the hell are these guys? It's actually quarantine, I think. So. They shall not be with the capsule when it returns. And where are they? This is the EVA report. The Highlands? Why is there so much radiation in the Highlands? Then again, nano sieverts per hour are not that much. So two, two, three millisieverts per year is really not a big deal. Danger. Right, so switch back to the pod. That's this one here, and let's recover that. That should give us some science. Now, if you're wondering, it would, I'm not actually getting double here for transmitting it and then recovering it. Upon quick loading, that transmission also never happened. So I'm not cheating for points here, just for time. And of course, the three Kerbals, they are gone. That, incidentally, does mean that we're going to have to pay a visit to the Kerbal Recruitment Center because we're fresh out of young, eager, willing, strapping astronauts. <laughs> They're either all on the moon in labs or 
dead. Most of them are dead. But then again, we have like four or five on the uh, Earth Research Station, and two times two, well, no, five in total on the Moon Research Station. And I think my game has crashed because this loading screen is taking far too long. Let me fiddle around with that a bit. So I had a game crash. Um, I think most of my narrative did get through but the RAM on my computer over overspilled and well threw the game out. Checking into the research and development center we see we have 564 science points which if you're versed in this science game means enough for this crazy note with the solar sail also called light sails or photon sails are a form of spacecraft propulsion using the radiation pressure from stars to push large ultra thin mirrors to high speeds. I do wonder how they have implemented that in the game and we're going to find out because this is the node I'm purchasing here. Whoa! And I did not expect that to unlock this so quickly. The next thing we are going to want is for 1000 science to Dino... the Dino Kai... the Dinonicus... the Dinonicus 1-D. The Space Exploration Corp. Elon Kerman's Space Exploration Corp. That's good. Oh, this is a wonderful engine running on liquid methane and oxidizer. Designed to reduce the cost of spacecraft launches as well as open up interesting possibilities for in situ utilization of resources on other celestial bodies, the Deinonychus, Deinonychus offers considerable advantage over previous generations boosters. So that gets liquid methane. Oh, this is wonderful. We want this. We want this bad. Yes, this is this is going to replace the mainsail immediately. Great. So we want that. And what's this? Uh, the methane tank, obviously. We need that. It's <laughs> identical to the Rocomax fuel tank. This tank contains methane, which is lower density than competing fuels. Are bigger numbers to be involved in the marketing process. That's nice. And what do you have here? The ultra methane tank. Wonderful. This is great. This is we 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 want this. Definitely we want this. 1,000 science points. A bargain. Only need 986 more points. Easy. And here we have fusion power. We also want this. This 3,000 science points. Wow, that's so expensive. <coughs> we want this because then with this we can well get antimatter initiated reactors, fusion reactors, and these produce so much megawatts that the plasma thrusters and those things become viable and interesting so yes 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 the gecko fusion a small fusion reactor and i think this also upgrades the ooh, what's this the dt vista in inertial fusion engine 1100 thrust and 15000 specific impulse runs on deuterium and tritium oh no i don't think you can get deuterium from the vehicle assembly building. I think you have to get that from the world. It always requires two and a half gigawatts of input power as well. Um, yes, uh, so we want the, we, we are going to need these reactors also. <laughs> uh, awesome stuff here to play with. So going to generate science, expect a mission tomorrow to go back to Mercury and Venus because those launch windows are coming up again to get some science to hopefully get this and who knows what else today's episode wasn't so long but we did get some science and some progress and have interesting technologies to look forward to oh before I leave I'm going to have one quick look at this solar sail to see what it looks like which is of course the most important part in any breakthrough propulsion system so would that even be listed under propulsion? Could be in utility, I think. Although in my in my book it counts as propulsion for sure. Science maybe. Checking back with propulsion then. It looked like some kind of cylinder in the the R and D facility. Yeah, the solar sail. So. Let's just grab a pod. Look at the Rocomax. 
That does have more thrust than the Denonicus, but horrible ISP. So that's the Denonicus is probably going to be a second stage engine. Anyway, today we're looking at the solid for the solar sail. It's super light, so perhaps we can immediately use this to well to do something. Oh yeah, we have no crew. Oh, we have one. Great, Jervis Kerman. Or is that the one he just automatically recruits? I think it recruits one automatically if you don't have any crew. Anyway, we're going to test the solar sail and we're going to send off, off probes tomorrow to get more science, to get more technology, to get more toys. Right. Deploy the sail. That can only turn out bad if we do it here on on the but whoa whoa this is large that's amazing <laughs> it 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 has a low amount of, of force it's like 8.3 times 10 to the power minus 3 newtons that's like eight thousands of a newton what and i'm guessing it, this will only go perpendicular to the to the sun, but we're definitely gonna shoot one of these up into space and see how that behaves. That's that's awesome. Great. Can it also retract that? Yeah, wonderful. So that's going into space for sure, but not today. Today I'm Lorenzo. Thanks for watching. Check back tomorrow to see how we get on with this solar sail stuff, um, and I'll see you then. Goodbye.